So if you're like me during COVID-19, you have made some purchases over the last several months, probably. Life has changed, life is very different now, and so you've been probably spending your money in some different places. I noticed something, I've got three kids, ages eight, five, and three, and we, we for the most part, stay pretty active as a family, but during COVID, and, and we've just noticed we're a little bit lazier <laughs> as a family. Instead of going out and doing something, we'll just like stay back and watch a show. Instead of getting out with a bunch of friends, we tend to just stay put at home. And, and part of that makes sense, but there's also part of that like, man, like we cannot just be lazy all the time. We've told our kids that we try to be active, we try to be out. And even though life looks a little bit different, that's still important. So I decided, I told my boys a, a few weeks ago, I said, boys, we've got to do something so that we're a little bit more active. I think you're going to love this. Come with me. So I, after school, they went with me, and we went to Academy, and I bought something. And my kids kind of have this running list of, Dad, that's another thing you just bought in quarantine. And I'm like, we're technically not in quarantine right now. Yes, we bought it still under the pandemic of COVID-19, but this technically is out of quarantine. So we went, we picked this out, we came back, they helped me put it up, but we bought our very first, and I emphasize the word family here because everybody in our family has used it, even my three-year-old, my, my daughter, but we bought our first family punching bag. It's been awesome. We put it up in the garage, they picked it out with me, they got their boxing gloves, and this was one of those ways for us to stay active. So even though we're not going out about as much, it's like, guys, we still have to stay active. So they've been out there, they've been going at it on the punching bag, both of them, and I'm like, this has actually worked out well. There's been a nice byproduct of this is they don't hit each other as much, they just hit this punching bag, it's been great. My three-year-old, my daughter Collins, you heard me say she uses it, she goes out there, and I'll just, she just wails on this thing, and I'm like, man, girl, what is wrong? Preschool couldn't have been that bad today. <laughs> it's been so much fun for us to get re-engaged and to be active again. And I see that in our faith as well. I see that in our spiritual lives where just under the umbrella, man, just life is different now. Things have changed. I get it. It's different. And I think when things get drastically different, we kind of just hunker down, don't we? And, and I'm not going to say that we're all lazy, but maybe. <laughs> In our faith, at least, have we gotten a little lazy in our faith, me included? And what does it look like to re-engage? What does it look like to be active again? It might look a little bit different than what we did before in our faith and in pursuing Jesus. Again, he knows us full well. What does it look like in this new life of ours to get to know Jesus even more? We're going to look at, a, look at a story this morning, Luke chapter 5, if you want to follow along. Great story. It's one of my favorites. And I want you to pay attention to the active parts of the story, the engagement, the, the, the movement that's happening in this story, and compared to the sitting still, I'm not going to say lazy necessarily, but the passive faith that you see here. So look for the activity, the active, the engagement, but then also look for those that are just kind of sitting and watching and having things happen to them. Here's the story, and then we're going to talk through it. Luke chapter 5, starting verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Did you pick up on it already? What were they doing? They were sitting there, sitting and watching. It goes on and says that they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So you had these religious leaders, these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, that came from all over. They traveled a great distance to just come and sit and watch Jesus. Now, I have no problem with sitting and watching because that's what all of you are doing online and right here, right now. There's nothing wrong with that. But in regards to our faith, have we gotten to a place where we just kind of like sit and watch Jesus? Yeah, we make the effort to get to him, but then it's like, okay, now we're here. Jesus, impress me. Jesus, do something We've heard some rumors, we've heard some stories, we, we've heard about you, so now we just want to see what you do. These Pharisees just sat and were listening and watching Jesus. They weren't doing anything once they got to him, truly just sitting. Now compare to what we see happen next. Verse 18, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now that would be the opposite of sitting, wouldn't it? They're not just sitting around. No, they're, they're active. They're engaged. They're moving. In fact, they're picking up a paralyzed man and carrying him to Jesus. It says, they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus, but when they could not find a way to do this 
because of the crowd, meaning a lot of other people that were just sitting and watching Jesus, when they couldn't find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. What a great story of seeing these two groups of people, a group of people that desired to know Jesus on some level, I would even say maybe the Pharisees were more interested in Jesus. He was an interesting individual that a lot of people were talking about. So they traveled to see him, and then they just sat and watched. They just wanted to see Jesus, and they sat there. Then you have these some men that heard about Jesus and heard that he was healing people and heard that he had been doing miracles and heard that he was radically changing how people live. And they said, not only do we want to go see Jesus, we're going to take somebody with us. So they actively got engaged with somebody else. We don't know that it was a family or a friend. By the language, it just sounds like it was a person that they'd run into, an acquaintance, maybe even a stranger. But they looked at a man that needed Jesus, and then they recognized where Jesus was at and says, we're going to do whatever it takes to get you to him. So they picked him up and they carried him to the house where Jesus was at. And then they didn't stop at anything, did they? They did whatever it took to get him to Jesus by getting him up on the roof, putting a hole in the roof, and then lowering down in front of Jesus. Now I would imagine that all those people sitting there watching Jesus are also watching a man be lowered through the roof in front of Jesus. You're probably thinking, what in the world is Jesus about to do? Here's Jesus' response to what just happened, verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, he saw something, didn't he? It wasn't just people sitting there waiting, sitting there watching. When Jesus saw their faith, when he saw an active faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, talking to the man on the floor now in front of him, friend, your, your sins are forgiven. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, look at their questions they're thinking, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So here Jesus, in response to the man that has just been lowered down through the tiles in the roof in front of him, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Now understand what that means. If you know this, I want you to say it with me. The wages of sin is death. So our sins, our mistakes, our rebellion against God, when we go against anything that he says, that is our sin. And our sin separates us from God, and the wages of sin is death. And here Jesus heals this man for all of eternity in a spiritual, in a spiritual sense. Because of our sins keep us from God, we do not get to spend eternity with him in heaven unless our sins are forgiven. And that's exactly what Jesus does for him, and he also does that for us. That's, what, that's why he came to earth and died on the cross. So here Jesus looked at this man on the floor and says, your sins are forgiven. Changed his life for all of eternity in that one response. Changed his life forever. And now these Pharisees are thinking to themselves, who is this man? They didn't even call man. Who is this fellow? Who is this guy? They obviously didn't know Jesus very well. If they're thinking to themselves, who is this guy that thinks he can forgive sins? Who is this guy that thinks he can do that? Now, Jesus, of course, knowing all things, look at his response to the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees were just thinking these things. Verse 22, I love this. Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? That's a little intimidating, isn't it? When you have the Son of God look at you and say, I know what you're thinking. Why are you thinking those things? They obviously didn't respond, so he answers the question or begins to ask more questions. He says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know, remember the Pharisees didn't know who he truly was. Who is this guy? Jesus says, no, I want you to know who this guy is. He says, I want you to know that the Son of Man, talking about himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So then he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was filled with amazement and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things that day. A great story that shows an active faith, movement, and engagement towards Jesus, and then a very passive faith, if you could even really call it a faith, of just kind of sitting and waiting, sitting and watching, sitting and being interested in Jesus. Out of this story, I want us to learn a lot from those some men. In fact, there's four things I want you to know that applies to us as well, that we see it in evidence in their story, but I think it can be part of our story as well. The first one is just know who Jesus is. You have to start there. 
know who Jesus is. Remember, the Pharisees didn't really know who Jesus was at the time. They, they just heard some things about him. They were interested in him. They wanted to see some things, so they went to see him, and then they just sat. But these some men, they knew who Jesus is. They knew exactly what he was capable of. They knew that he was there healing people. They knew that he could do miracles. And because they knew who Jesus truly was, it changed everything in their life to the point of them, them not just wanting to go and see Jesus, but them take somebody who needed Jesus with them. Again, they knew there was a paralyzed man who needed Jesus, and they knew that Jesus could heal him. So they said, we need to do whatever it takes to get him to Jesus. Have you ever heard the phrase or something like it, you do crazy things when you're in love? Crazy in love, crazy stupid in love, right? There's a ton of movies about them. Right? There's that idea, and we love watching those movies where, where the people in the story, they go to just extraordinary measures to get one another back. They do some crazy things because of love. We do that in our families, don't we? I'm crazy about my kids. I do some crazy things because I love my kids. In fact, yesterday, I sat through a five-year-old soccer game in the rain. It seems crazy, and it seems strange, and I promise I would not have done that for any other child except my own, but I love them, so I do something that's a little crazy and a little strange, a little odd. We do that as spouses. We do crazy things because we love our spouse. We do things we wouldn't do for anybody else, that when anybody else looks, you're like, that's a little strange, that's a little odd, maybe even a little crazy. You're like, yeah, but I love them, so I do crazy things for them. When you look at the story of these some men, they did some crazy things, all because they knew Jesus and loved him. It was pretty crazy that they went to a man they most likely didn't know and said, we're gonna carry you someplace. That's a little crazy. <laughs> it's a little more crazy when they pick him up and they actually carry him to this place where Jesus is at. It's a little crazy that they would make that journey. Then they run into the crowd, remember? It was so crowded they couldn't get in. They ran into a problem. Now it would have made sense for these some men to say, you know what, we tried our best, we did what we could, it's just not gonna work. Maybe we'll leave you here, maybe you'll see Jesus on his way out, well, I don't know what else to tell you, we did what we could. No, but they knew who Jesus was, and they knew how much Jesus changed his life, so they did something a little more crazy. They said, we're gonna put you up on the roof. Just imagine seeing some guys carrying a paralyzed person and putting them on their roof. Your first reaction would be, that's crazy, and I'm calling the cops. So then they get them up there and they're like, let's do something a little bit more crazy. They start tearing apart the roof and they make a hole in the roof, a man-sized hole in the roof. It's a little crazy. It's a little strange. And then they lower this man down through the hole in the roof, right in front of Jesus. It's a little strange, a little odd, and maybe even a little crazy. But when you know who Jesus is and you love him, because of the love that he has given you, when you realize and know the grace and forgiveness and peace and joy and all those things that he gives you unconditionally, yeah, we act a little crazy. In fact, if, if you're a believer, the non-believers probably look at you and think you're a little strange. They look at you and you're like, your life is a little odd. It doesn't quite add up. It doesn't make a, total, a lot of sense. You do some crazy things. As believers, You've already done something pretty crazy, in my opinion. You woke up early, got semi-dressed up. Some of you really dressed up. Make me look bad here. You get dressed up, and you go to some warehouse on a Sunday morning, which is most of your all's day off. That's a little strange. That's a little odd. And then we sing songs together that, that are up on a screen, and, and we even maybe raise our hands. Anybody looking in that doesn't know Jesus, that looks super weird. <laughs> Have you ever thought about what a church service looks like on the outside? It's super strange. If you tithe, if you give of your income, giving 10% of your money back to God through the church, some would say that's just dumb. <laughs> it's crazy. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You volunteer, you serve, you give of yourself to not just the church, but your, your, your neighbors, your people around you, your community. That's, a lot of, that's strange because you have so many other things going on. You have so many other things you could put your time and effort into. So that's a little strange that you would do that. You pray for your enemies. As believers, we're told to pray for our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, to bless those who curse you. Man, that doesn't make any sense. Help me understand that one. That seems a little odd and strange and crazy. We could go on and on and on about what the life of a believer should look like and how strange, odd, and crazy it is and how it looks. But when you know who Jesus is, these some men knew 
who Jesus was. And they were willing to do some pretty crazy things in the name of love. Something to maybe just think through, even possibly even write this down, is how would you finish this sentence? Because I know who Jesus is, how would you finish that? Because I know who Jesus is, what's so different about your life? What's a little bit crazy and maybe even a little strange and odd about your life? Because you know who Jesus is. First thing I want you to know, know who Jesus is. That's where we start. Second one is know your part. Know your part. So a good part of this story is the miracle that Jesus gives. Technically, there's two. There's the forgiveness of all of this man's sin, changed his life for all of eternity. We would call that salvation. But then you also have the miracle of take your mat, get up, take your mat, and go home. So Jesus healed this man spiritually, but also physically, now and forever. And oftentimes we focus on that miracle of the story and go to any of the miracles of Jesus and we tend to focus on the miracle that Jesus did. But there's another part to the miracle that we sometimes overlook. It's the part that we as people play in that miracle. In fact, this would be a great study for you at some point this week. Start looking through and studying the different miracles of Jesus and look for the different parts people played in that miracle. It'll fascinate you, it's amazing. So here, Jesus healed a man spiritually, but also physically, but don't miss the part that these some men played. If these some men did not pick up this man and carry him to Jesus and take him up on the roof, make a hole in the roof and lower him down through the roof, would this man have experienced that miracle? I don't know. But I know that this man experienced that miracle at least because these some men played a part in his life change story. Now, these some men did not heal him they did not forgive his sins. They did not help him walk. They played the part of getting him to the one that could, but they still had a part to play. It's the same for us in the kingdom of God. And I'm not just talking our little church here. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the role that we play in God's kingdom. Let me read a couple of verses for you. Verse, or chapter 12 out of 1 Corinthians gives a lot more around this. I'm just gonna read you 27. If you wanna go back, read the rest of it. But 27 sums it all up. He says, now you are the body of Christ. That's another name for the church. You are part of the church. You are part of the kingdom of God. You are part of the body of Christ. Look, and each one of you is part of it. You could, you could personalize that and say, no, I am part of the body of Christ. I am part of the church. I am part of the kingdom of God. And yes, I have a part of it. We all have a part of being part of this thing called church and God's kingdom. In 1 Peter, we see something very similar. Chapter four, verse 10, we're told each of you should use whatever gift you have received, look, to serve others. Why? As faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. In other words, what God has given you, you then have a desire to give that to others. What God has given me, I want to serve others. Whatever I have been given, whatever you have been given, we do that for others. We all have a part to play. Know your part. Now this next part of what I'm about to say, hear me and know my heart a little bit on this one. It is not to make you feel guilty at all, okay? Now if you feel guilty, maybe that's conviction between you and the Holy Spirit, I'll let you take that up with him. But my goal is not to make you feel guilty here at all. Think through, if we are all part of the body of Christ, right? And if one of those parts is missing, does that body thrive because of the missing part or does that body suffer because of the missing part? Which one, thrive or suffer? Suffer, of course. If you break your hand, the whole body suffers because now the rest of the body has to pick up the slack for that broken hand or that broken arm. When one part of the body gets hurt, the whole body feels it and the whole body hurts. So if each and every one of us is what 1 Corinthians as well as what 1 Peter tells us is true, then when we are missing, when one part is missing, the entire body suffers. Please hear this. When you miss, you are missed. Now, I'm not talking about attendance online, folks. This has nothing to do with you not physically being here at all. We are part of the body of Christ regardless of where we meet and how we meet. But are you doing your part? What part has God called you to play? Because when you're not doing your part, the body feels it and suffers. So the question I would want you to begin to ask Jesus, this is between you and him, not you and me. Well, what part is he calling you to play in this season even? Because those parts can change. 
The part of, the, of this story, these some men, their part to play was to get a paralyzed man to Jesus. And it changed lives. What part is God calling you to play that has the potential for a miracle, that has the potential to change lives for all of eternity and starting today? Know your part and know that you are part of something so much bigger than just your little world and my little world. We're part of the kingdom of God and we have a part. And when we don't do our part, the body suffers. So know who Jesus is. Know what your part is in that. That's a great journey, a great discussion between you and the Lord this week. Third thing I'd want you to know is know that you need them and they need you. Know that you need them and they need you. As I read through that story, my guess is you related to one or the other in the sense of the men doing the carrying or the man being carried. And throughout our lives, we're going to experience both of those. Sometimes they happen in a long period of time. Hey, in this season of my life, I feel like I'm the person being carried. Life is tough. Life is hard. I'm not doing very well. So I need people to carry me. Some seasons of your life, you're like, man, I'm rocking and rolling. I'm moving forward. I've got the capacity and the ability to carry someone else. I can carry on their burdens and I can walk alongside them and help them along the way. You're going to experience, you have experienced both of those. I need to be carried and I'm also doing some carrying. Sometimes those seasons are really short. Sometimes you're like, I need to be carried on Monday, but by Friday, you're ready to help somebody else out. So you're gonna see that ebb and flow of, I need to be carried, I need someone to carry. I need to be carried, I can be there for someone else now. You need them, and they need you. This man does not get to Jesus without those some men carrying him. But here's the other great part. Those some men, they still got to Jesus. Both. The ones carrying and the ones being carried, they both made it to Jesus. So I'd encourage you, start thinking through what season are you in? That will help determine a lot of what your next steps are. Are you in a season where you just need some people around you to support you and carry you and help you out? There's nothing wrong with that. Be okay with that. Ask for the help. Ask for the people around you. You need them and they need you. Are you in a season where you can help someone else? Are you in a season where you can carry those around you? Know that, be aware of that, and be looking for the people that God is calling you to carry in this season. Where are you at currently? The New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, speaks to this need that we have for others. In fact, that's how we were created. Yes, we were created to be part of God's kingdom, to play a part, but we also have a part in each other's lives. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Do you hear that? You've probably heard that. It's a pretty famous scripture. Of we need one another because we make each other better. We make each other stronger. We rough off those rough edges of one another. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Look at this. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But look at the other side. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Let me say that again. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. You are not meant to go through life alone. You are not meant to go through the season you're in now alone. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You were not intended to go through this alone. Lastly, Hebrews 10. And let us consider how we may spur one another on. Listen to that. Consider, think, plan, brainstorm. How can we spur one another on towards love and good deeds? Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Now that again doesn't have to necessarily be physically on a Sunday morning. He's not talking about church there the way that we would define it. It's the need for one another in our lives. The need to have other people in in our lives. Know that you need them and they need you. Do you guys ever have like family meetings at home? Or you like call a family meetings? It's not necessarily like a bad thing, but it's a, hey, we need to focus on something. We need to have a talk. We need to have a heart to heart. You guys, you guys do those as families? We have those all the time in our family, I feel like. It's like, okay, everybody around the dinner table, let's talk through something important. I wanna have a family meeting with my church for a second. Can we have a family meeting for a second? You're not in trouble, it's not a bad thing. So don't be all tense with me. 
I just wanna share something that I've observed over the last several months. Obviously, we're in still kind of this weird limbo pandemic, not pandemic. It was weird watching Clemson football last night, last night with no people in the stands. The Falcons play today, no one's in this. It's just a weird season, right? I get it, it's weird. But here's what I'm observing, and I feel like we're in a pretty dangerous spot as people. And not just talking believers, but I think especially as believers, but as people, I think we're kind of in a dangerous spot that I want us to just think about for a moment. In, the, in this concept of we need others and they need us. Because of our need for safety right now, right? Coronavirus, regardless of what you think about it, this is not a political statement, and I hope if you're offended by what I'm about to say, give me a little grace and know my heart a little bit on this one, all right? But because of our need for safety, things have changed, and we've intentionally isolated to some point, right? And, and some of those have been great benefits, like a lot of good has come out of that. But because of our need to be safe and to keep people at a distance, we do a lot of things without interacting with anybody else. So you can go grocery shopping without ever getting out of your car. You don't have to interact with anybody anymore. You can go to work and not have to really meet with anybody and see anybody. You can do most of that, depending on your job, most of that can be done virtually. You can get your food from a restaurant without ever having to leave your home. No contact is, is like a good thing right now. I can get my food and it's no contact. Now this is not new because of the pandemic, but in the church world, you can show up at church and not engage with anybody. And again, that's not, nothing against watching online and being part of online. It, again, you can be part of church regardless of where and how you meet. You can sit in this room and fail to engage with any other person around you. So yes, I, I want us to be safe, but here's what I see has happened. We have in the intent and desire to be safe, we have defaulted to doing things in an easy way. And here's what I mean by that. So to be safe, I need to keep people at a distance. The easiest way to keep people at a distance is to isolate myself from everybody else. So yes, that keeps you safe, but it also makes it easy. The easy way out is just to stay away and not interact with anybody. I wanna suggest that yes, we need to stay safe, but to be effective. Instead of being safe and going the easy route, be safe, but make sure we're not losing our effectiveness. And let me just say, being effective is a lot harder. Because you can be safe and still have meaningful relationships, but yes, it's a lot harder. You can be safe and still have a thriving relationship with your neighbors, and yes, it's a lot harder. You can be safe, but still have healthy relationships within church and school and community, but absolutely, it is a lot harder, it is a lot easier to stay safe and be isolated. I said this is a dangerous spot that we find ourselves in because we are not intended to be isolated. So am I telling you to throw caution to the wind and just start gathering in large groups of people? No, please don't mishear me. Stay safe. But can we as a church admit that maybe we've gotten a little bit lazy in the name of safety? That maybe we need to do a little bit of the hard work to keep those relationships alive and meaningful. That yes, church is important, whether you are online or in the room or you watch it on a Sunday or a Thursday night on demand. But it's not just about listening and sitting. The Pharisees did that and they did it well. How are we engaging one another? How are we staying active in our faith? I don't have a ton of answers for it. I just wanna be part of a church that says, let's figure that out. Yes, let's stay safe. Let's continue to do the right thing, but not at the expense of missing out on relationships that we are intended to have. And it will be harder because we've not had to figure that out before. Can we do that? Can we wrestle with that? That's not an overnight decision. But what I see with these some men is when they figured out, they, when they came into a problem, remember, they tried to get this man to Jesus and they ran into a problem. Oh, there's a lot of people there. We can't get through. It would have been a lot easier to say, sorry, we tried. It was a lot harder to come up with a different plan and a different way, and they refused to stop. They said, no, this is so much, this is so much more important. We will do whatever it takes to get this person to Jesus. We will do whatever it takes to keep our relationships healthy. We will do whatever it takes to keep our marriages healthy. We will do whatever it takes to keep our kids in a healthy place in their relationship with others and most importantly with Jesus. We will do whatever it takes to make sure our church family stays in a healthy place. And yes, we wanna stay safe, but not at the sacrifice 
I've seen people know Jesus. So let's figure out another way to do that. If we can't get through the front door, let's make a hole in the roof. You've got permission. Put holes in the roof. Let's figure out another way, another way to stay safe, but also remain effective. And yes, it will be harder, but don't stop. Know that you need them and they need you, maybe now more than ever. Last thing I wanna let you know that I hope you would know, and it has to do with what Jesus told this man that was healed. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. That line always fascinated me because there's a part in there that I don't think is necessary. Jesus healed this man, but yet he instructed him to get up. That makes sense. Here's a man that has not gotten up maybe for, the, for his entire life or at least for a long time. Something he was never able to do, Jesus now said, now you can do, get up. And he was able to get up. But then Jesus instructed him, take your mat and go home. Why take your mat? Like that mat represented everything he couldn't do. That mat was what he was used to laying on because he couldn't walk. Wouldn't it have made more sense for Jesus to say, get up, leave your mat and go home? Why take it? Here's what I think. I could be wrong, we can argue about it later if you want to. I think Jesus said, take your mat because this man who was used to relying on his mat for the first time picked his mat up put his mat on his shoulder, walked, maybe even ran out of that house. Could you imagine the feeling of what you normally always sat on now you're carrying around? Could you imagine the conversations of people that recognize this man? Why is he carrying that mat? He's supposed to be sitting on it. I would be carrying that mat around loud and proud because I've never been able to before. It was part of his life change story. I think so often, we want to forget our past. Oh, please hear me. Do not forget your past. If you forget your past, you're forgetting what you've been saved from. If you forget your past, you're forgetting the miracle that Jesus has done in your life. If you forget your past, you're missing and forgetting on what Jesus has done in your life. No, that take your mat is remembering the life change that Jesus has done in your life. No, you're not held back by your past anymore. You're not defined by your past anymore. But man, you get to show, yeah, I used to, but now I am. I used to be, but now God's made me. That's who I am. And that mat for that paralyzed man was his life change story. Let's not leave it and forget it. Let me show you what Jesus has done in my life and saved me from. So know what Jesus has done for you. Never forget what Jesus has done for you. Always remember what he has saved you from, the sins he has forgiven you of, the past and the history that he does not hold against you, but he does know. Remember, he knows you fully and he still loves you fully. Know who Jesus is, know the part that you play in the greater picture, in the kingdom of God and in the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, us, you have a part in that. Know that you need them and they need you. We need one another and especially now. Maybe you're carrying someone, maybe you need to be carried by somebody. But at the end of the day, never forget what he has done in your life. Always know what he has done for you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are and who you say that we are. Thank you for knowing us fully and still loving us no matter what. Jesus, I would pray that if there's anybody online or in the room that doesn't know you yet, I pray that that would happen right here and right now. Your scripture in Romans 10 tells us if we believe in our heart that you are alive, that God raised you, Jesus, from the dead, and we profess from our mouth that you are our savior, you are our Lord, you are our king, that's what saves us. It's nothing that we do, it's nothing that we earn, it's nothing we could ever do to deserve to be saved, it's only by your grace that you give us. Oh, but we have to choose to accept it. So may we know who you are, may you be known as the king of our lives and the Lord of our lives, and may it change everything. May our lives look a little crazy because of it. Help us to know our part, help us to wrestle with what you are calling us to do. Help us to know 
that we have a need for other people in our lives. And yes, we might need to be a little bit creative on how we maintain those relationships, especially now. But may we not use that as an excuse to isolate. May we use that as an opportunity to be creative in how we love you and love others. May we never forget what you've done on the cross for us. That your death on the cross forgave all of our sins. You paid our debt. The tomb is empty, though, which gives us life and hope. That is what we know. In Jesus' name, amen.